Welcome back to The Daily Dose, my friends. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. So we are at day number 251 today. We are looking at the book of Mark, chapters 3 and 4, and we also have Psalm number 96 for today. All right, so let's take a little look at what we have got on the summary for today. Um, first, we come across the section where we are told that Jesus heals on the Sabbath, okay? And so I'll just start right here and read a few verses at the beginning of chapter 3, okay? Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Okay, so again, performing any kind of work on the Sabbath was considered a sin, <clears throat> and they were going to look at Jesus performing a miraculous healing as him doing some sort of work, right? Quid pro quo, he would be sinning in their eyes, um, which isn't actually the case, but that's what they were trying to do. So, um, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Okay, then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill, but they remained silent, right? Okay, so he looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. Okay, so here we, we see Jesus knowing what's in their hearts, knowing what's on their minds, that they're trying to accuse him, just waiting for him to heal someone, to do something good, so that they can falsely accuse him, right, of something that wasn't even um, spe specified in the commands that God gave Moses, right? Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or evil, right? So here Jesus breaks it down to like, it's not even about working or not working. It's about, look, I I'm doing good. I'm loving someone. Is loving someone working, right? You know, I mean, what, what exactly are you guys after? It, it seems to kind of be what he's saying almost. But so then notice, Jesus looks around and he tells the man with the shriveled hand, stretch out your arm. Stretch out your hand. Stretch it out. Stick it out there. Watch this. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. So notice that there is no explanation to what happened other than somehow Jesus healed him. But Jesus did not perform any sort of outward action to demonstrate the healing, right? Like he didn't touch it. He didn't grab it with his hands. He didn't spit on dirt and rub it into a little bit of mud and then rub it on the guy like he's done to people's eyes in the past. He did not do any outward action. He did not even touch the man. All he did was tell the man, hey, stick out your hand. And the guy did, <clears throat> and he was healed. So Jesus is, is almost, um, to me it seems as if he's sort of saying in, in an inadvertent way, like, look, I'm not allowed to heal. Okay, prove I just healed him. Prove it. What did I do? I didn't even touch the guy, right? So anyways, after that, the Pharisees went out and began to plot which of the Herodians, excuse me, with the Herodians, how they might kill Jesus. So they were like, wow, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. He got us, he got us good, and that's it. It's time to take this dude out, is essentially where they're at. So the next section talks about how crowds follow Jesus. Jesus was a popular dude, okay? A lot of people followed him because of his miracles and because of things they wanted from him. <clears throat> a lot of people followed Jesus because of who he actually was. And um, other people followed him because they wanted to hear his teachings and learn more. So all kinds of people followed him for a variety of reasons, but he had a mass following. There were always crowds coming and looking for him wherever he was at, right? So um, moving on to this next section that talks a little bit about some of these crowds. It says, when they heard about all he, Jesus, was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. So basically from all over the place. Like they're not just people that are hanging out coming from downtown Jerusalem. There's people that are coming from the burbs, from everywhere, right? Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. Right, so can you imagine like if it would almost be... Like, if a, if, think about if a rock star was trying to do a concert, right? Like some big world famous, you know, rock star, some band. They were going to do a concert, and they just set up in the middle of, um, in the middle of the park with no barricades, 
no stage, no police protection, no nothing. Do you think they'd actually be able to put on a show? No, the mobs would be flocking them. The mobs would be all over them. The mobs would be trying to take selfies, trying to get autographs signed. Um, there wouldn't be any room for the band to move around to even play their instruments, I don't think, right? And, and I'm, I'm kind of speculating a little bit here, but that's, that's sort of what, what I think is going on, right? Jesus would not have been able to to speak because the crowds would have been like all up in his face. He wouldn't have been able to move. He probably wouldn't have been able to sit down because when people come in a crowd, in a mob, there often tends to be a sort of mob mentality, right? So Jesus sort of, need, sort of needed to have some sort of a separation, some sort of a barrier um, so that he could at least just have his personal space and still be able to um, speak to and interact with the crowds, right? So the disciples went and they got a little boat. And um, the idea was that they were all going to get on this little boat. They were going to push off deep enough into the water that the people would say, okay, well, we might as well just stand here. We've got a good enough view of Jesus. We can hear him. We're not going to go out there and try to tread water and tip the boat over. So um, the next little section we come to is about Jesus appointing the 12. Okay. And here it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. Notice. He called to himself those he wanted, right? First, the first, the first thing is he called. And I believe that that's what God does to believers too. I believe that our hearts are tainted by sin and that we have no love for God, that we in, inwardly, whether we realize it or not, we despise God. We want, we want nothing to do with God. The book of Romans talks a lot about that. Okay, and it is first that God must touch us, that God must call us. And in a very real sense, God does call everyone to repentance, right? God calls, in a sense, calls, tells, commands everyone, hey, y'all need to repent, y'all need to come to faith, you need to trust Jesus for what he did on the cross, right? God calls in a sense, but he calls in a different sense, right? There is a different sense that God can call in a personal way and in an effectual way, okay? Um, so, for example, uh, in the New Testament later on, I believe it's in some of Paul's letters, I think, um, where it talks about how those whom he calls, he justifies, and those whom he justifies, he sanctifies, right? And, and when it says those whom, all of the people whom he calls, all of them get justified, right? Well, if you take that to, to look at like the generic calling of like God's calling all people to come to him and to repent, well, we know that not everybody in the world is going to be justified and sanctified and saved because the Bible says that, right? So what could it mean? Well, if all who are called are justified and all of those people who are justified are sanctified and all of those are glorified, so on and so forth, then what that means is that God is responsible for initiating our salvation on an individual basis for every single one of us. It is God who specifically, individually, and effectually calls you and me. And when he calls us, we respond. Okay? And I believe that we have no choice but to respond if we are called among the elect of God. That's what Paul teaches, and I believe that's what the Bible teaches. So anyways, um, from there, uh, we just talked about how he called those he wanted, and they came to him, okay? He appointed 12 <clears throat> that they might be with him, and they might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So here, they're getting authority to basically do all of the stuff that Jesus did, for the most part right? They're, they're able to perform miracles and, and so on and so forth. Um, then we move into a section where Jesus is accused by his family and the Pharisees, right? It says, then Jesus entered a house, and again, the crowds gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind, right? Can you imagine if somebody that you grew up with, one of your brothers or your sisters or even one of your children, um, grew up, and then they were like, hey, by the way, you know, I'm the Messiah, and started doing miracles, I, it would be bizarre, right? It would be bizarre. It would be understandable how your average person might think that somebody was crazy that was claiming to be the Messiah and running around doing all of this 
weird supernatural type stuff, right? I mean, I can see how people might get that idea, especially people who are close, because like the Bible tells us, a prophet is without honor in his hometown, um, or is not without honor, if you're into double negatives. So that's an interesting thing to point out as well. It seemed that Jesus' family at first was conflicted, confused, didn't really believe what was going on with Jesus. They thought he was going a little bit loco in la cabeza, right? So then we move on to a parable about a sower, someone who sows seeds, which I'd love to get into, but I just don't have the time. Then there's a section about a lamp on a stand, um, and that's in, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 24 and 25. I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to do a separate video on that, I think, and I'll post it as a chaotic serenity. Um, and then we've got a few more parables, the parable of the growing seed, parable of the mustard seed, and then the ever so famous incident where Jesus calms the storm. So that's all we got for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you as always. If any of you have been here from the very beginning and you've watched Daily Dose number one all the way up through now, I appreciate you. Putting these things together is super time consuming. It's a whole lot of hard work. It takes away time that I could be spending with my family and doing other things. But you know what? I don't mind because I believe that God has called me to do this and I enjoy doing it. And I hope that God is using this to bless someone out there in some way, shape or form, um, whether it's when I'm actually posting these videos in real time live, or, you know, maybe 10 years down the road, you're watching this. So anyways, hey, thanks again. Appreciate you. And until we meet again, friends, deuces.